Good evening, gentle listeners, and welcome to Midnight Shenanigans with your hosts, Rachel, Moises, Sam, Vesper, Alex, James, Baylor, Yoshi, and Xander. This week, the Guild of Distractedness discuss the ever conflictive, ever menacing, yet entertaining to watch characters that give another reason to fill the seats in the theater, the couch at home, or have you glued to your phone. It's time for our favorite antagonists. Please prepare your wands of wickedness and enjoy the show. Welcome to Midnight Shenanigans Podcast, a show where we talk about the things that keep us up at night and compete to see who can bring the most interesting and thoughtful, provoking stories to the table. Today, uh, I am Rachel. I will be hosting tonight's tonight's discussion. And uh, to get our discussion started, I asked the group last week uh, who their favorite fictional antagonist is, whether it's from a book, a video game, uh, show doesn't matter as long as they're a fictional antagonist uh, who everybody's favorite is and I kind of want to start um, by letting everybody say who their favorite is and then I'll uh, go around asking each of you why the hell you're choosing that person how does that sound with everybody yeah sounds great yay okay so, do we have any volunteers who want to start? Uh, hello, my name is Moises, and the villain that I wanted to bring to the table today is Dracula from Netflix's Castlevania series. Ooh, Ooh I, I think he's so cool. I can't wait to talk about him today. I like that. Who's going next? Next person. Next person. Next person. Yeah. All right, so. All right, um, do you want to go, Shelly? Huh? Um, I thought Xander was about to talk. Sorry, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I I actually need, needed some help with uh, choosing between two antagonists that I had right, in mind. Xander, yeah. Yeah. So oh. one one is the inter- intergalactic space tyrant, and then the other was the man-made monster, and I was like. These are both good, and they could be very interesting because they have extensive backstories. But I just didn't know who to pick through between the two of them. Oh, oh, that's hard. Yeah, it is. I, I, I want to let everybody kind of have a say in what you what they think because I, I love, I love monsters. Do the man main monster. That's my vote. <laughs> I, that's what I, I was actually leaning for. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, I do it. Uh, you're talking about the, the Emperor in the Warhammer 40k universe, right? Incorrect, actually. No? Incorrect. Okay. <laughs> then, I, then I have zero idea who you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, I if, I, point. if I had to, if I had to re- v- unleash the veil as to who these two characters are, I guess well, I had... <laughs> Well, I, I think we still got to give everybody a chance to name their own villains. And then we we start explaining, right? Well, yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd still introduce right. these two villains. I'm not going to talk about them uh, until you know we make the the decision. But it's it's like if I if I just told you guys who they were, uh, would that make the decision easier? Probably. If you give us a, a little summary for. <clears throat> well, those as of us not as in depth. well as for the uh, intergalactic space tyrant. Uh, I wanted to go with Frieza from the Dragon Ball series. Ooh, that's a good one. Yes. Oh, come on now. That's, that's who the intergalactic space tyrant was. And then for the monster, I wanted to talk about the Indominus Rex from Jurassic World. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, you're good. See, that, that was my problem. They're, they're, they're both good, so I didn't know who to talk about. Knowing you do the dinosaur. Do the dinosaur, Sandy. Yeah. Knowing you the dinosaur do the dinosaur. Is for you? But Frieza is a good one. Oh, they're both Frieza good. Frieza is a good one. Yeah, that's really good, cool, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to enjoy this, actually. Oh, man. This is already going to be a challenge so, to pick who over. wins. We got to pick. <laughs> Just I'm, st- I'm still gotta... for the Indominus Rex. I'm for the Indominus Rex. I'm down yeah. with the Rex. Yeah, I'm in for the Giannis. 
Okay, so I got three for the Indominus. Uh, anybody? Yes, use through the wreck. Yes, through the wreck. I feel like you need to listen listen to your heart. You must choose the Rex. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I personally yeah, prefer Breeza, sounds... but, but hey. you... Hey. Yeah, it looks, it looks like the Indominus Rex. I don't want to you talk friends. about dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 I don't think you would. Yeah. Well... Well, I guess you got as a point long as there. You so. talk about the Rex, you'll be fine. You'll be good. You right. have all the research you need. All right. Looks like the Indominus beats Frieza today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the villain is Black Matt, so from Aquaman. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Nice. Um, I chose the Joker from the Dark Knight. Oh, I, yeah, I, I, I Heath Ledger class, classic. I, I, yeah. I personally stared away from that one because I, I figured someone else was going to talk about him. Well, it was between that. It was between that and Dark Vader. Uh, yeah, I, I yeah. chose the Joker. It was Dark <laughs> Vader from The Empire Strikes Back specifically. Oh, Darth Vader in The Empire Strikes Back is way more ruthless than in any other uh, incarnation of him. Yeah. I know you wanted to go earlier. Except for the Rogue One ending scene where he's just massacring the entire hallway. I kind of don't count that mostly because he wasn't supposed to be in Rogue One at the time. Uh, He was just added in at the last minute. It was cool, though. That was a really cool scene. It was a scene stealer. It really Uh, was. (laughs) James, who did you pick? So, since it was antagonists and not outright villains, I chose the Char from Guild Wars. Hmm. You chose who? The Char from Guild the Wars, he said. Oh, okay. So we're back oh. to the world of Guild Wars. Yeah. Guild Wars. Rusty. Rusty? <laughs> Me? Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh, I gotta, I gotta get a good, good intro in, okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna do the murderous ice cream loving and in love with a paper bag sweet tooth. Uh, uh, you know, he's just a big old guy who's in a driving tournament. Pretty cool. Pretty cool what? Dude. Real nice. Thank you. He was also a murderous clown with flaming hair. That's all I can say. Oh. Last but not least, Alex. Oh wait, no, it's it's Vesper, oh, Vesper, Vesper, and, Vesper and Alex. Vesper. I was about to say Vesper. Wait, yeah, Vesper and Alex. First. <laughs> you go first, Alex. No, oh. you. No, you. Uh-oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. I won that. Okay, Vesper, you go first, and then Alex, you're gonna you're gonna finish us off there. Yeah. My my antagonist is the horrifyingly beautiful, um, horrific. Uh, necromancer, the one and only, the bitch who doesn't die, Delilah Briarwood from Campaign One, a critical role, as well as uh, the first season of Legends of Vox Machina. Here we go again with the critical role stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we got re- two reoccurring yeah, topics I today. <laughs> I set a theme. <laughs> the and themes. my topic is from one of my favorite ABC series that's ever graced us. Once upon a time, our very own Regina Mills. I love her. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Evil Queen All right. herself. I'm never go wrong with Evil Queen. And although I will not be competing, I just wanted to give like if I were answering this, what I would give, and I'm I'm I'll I'll be very brief on it later, but um I chose uh the winner in my book for number one antagonist is definitely Sephiroth from Final Fantasy VII, because Ooh. Sephiroth. That's, oh, that's all you Sephiroth. need to know. Sephiroth, man. For now, that's all you need to know. It's yeah. Sephiroth. Really? It's gotta be. That's a good one. That's a good one, to be honest. That is a good There's, one. Yes. There it was, it would have been really hard to beat that. Here. A lot of good villains here with a very mixed bag. Like, there's no like. There's no antagonists here that are like too alike to another one. They're all different. Like, <laughs> I'm, I feel like this is like a, this is gonna be an interesting conversation. I believe so too. Great. Yeah. Oof. You guys are making this difficult for me. <laughs> we haven't even started yet. But all right. 
So, to defend yourselves, do we have anyone who would like to volunteer? I'll go through volunteers first, and then from then, you will be, uh, you will be chosen and sacrificed by yours truly. <laughs> we Can anyone do the Hunger Games whistle? I was, okay, about okay. To, I was about to make a Hunger Games reference. My, my volunteer is for you. <laughs> Oh, what is this? Three fingers, three fingers. A little bit later. Why is this three fingers? There you go. Up. Put your fingers up. Why is this volunteer okay. distribute? I I volunteer distribute. I'm excited for I'm excited for Dracula. I'm very excited. Considering that he's also technically a classic monster too, he's got an extensive history. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. The first thing oh, I was going to mention about Dracula mm -hmm. is that like before you even understand anything about Castlevania's specific version of dracula we all know the legend of dracula you know the the oldest vampire who lives in the big castle you know like he's said to have all these powers like you know the, 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 it's scary dude. <laughs> he, he he has a legend like it is it, there's a thing throughout history you know when it came to uh adapting him for uh the netflix show uh based on the video game series castlevania it's very unique because it did two things very, very well. It respected a lot of vampire like lore, smaller details about how vampires work and uh, their hierarchy uh, within the system, like relative to each other. And it also executed on on being a really good Castlevania story, like a a adapting the games really well. And uh, part of this is because Dracula. Dracula is every bit the legend that we see in history, right? Um, but the show takes a very, very different spin on Dracula as a character. Because most, like, I feel like most vampire shows, or I, I'm uneducated, actually, but I, I feel like a lot of vampire stories, it is very easy to make Dracula, like, just straight up the main villain, pure evil. You know, just hunger want to go drink right but castlevania portrays dracula in a very interesting light his very like intimidating nature like his, uh, the, the fact that like you know everybody fears him like he he keeps people away like he has people on stakes <laughs> like dead bodies on stakes outside of his castle right to ward any anyone from coming because he's he's just sick of humanity he describes it as just being completely sick of humanity. The story starts when a woman named uh, Lisa uh, comes at her door, or uh, at Dracula's door. She gets acquainted with him. Uh, she actually comes to learn the science that uh, Dracula has learned and kept evolving on, kept iterating on over the years. And she begins to practice medicine that is actually helping in communities as she goes throughout the world. She ends up falling in love with Dracula, and they end up having a kid. Castlevania starts with a love story between an apothecary traveling into Dracula's castle. <laughs> you know, and it is with Dracula. That's how it starts. And then the church burns his life. And oh. it's a very, it's like a very, like, messed up scene. Like, she has all of these, you know, like, vials and potions and stuff in her house. Like, because, you know, she's an apothecary. Like, she... She helps, like, cure people, right? Like, she has books on anatomy, right? But uh, priests of that time came in, and they looked at all of this stuff, and they were like, Oh, it moves on its own! Devil engines! Evil! Witch! They burned her. And Dracula comes back, comes back, completely unaware that this has happened, and he finds out that the church burned his wife. And it proves every single instinct that he's had about humanity completely right in that moment he completely has is like zero regard for humanity and he wants them dead he wants them all dead like it it, 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 it gets it gives you the setup for you know the overarching story and the castlevania games where you go fight dracula he's the big bad the story ends up following um trevor belmont uh, the Vampire Hunter, Saifa Melnades, uh, a, a speaker magician, like a, a, a magician who's like from a, tri uh, a tribe of wandering nomads. <laughs> Alucard, 
who is the son of Lisa and Dracula. And Alucard, one of, one of my favorite things about it is that like Alucard is violently opposed to the to the genocide on humanity. He he is like, no, you got to stop this. This is not okay. But but he's not like opposed to getting revenge. <laughs> Basically, Dracula is saying all of humanity needs to die. There is not a single innocent left. And Alucard's like, no, let's just go kill the motherfucker who did it. <laughs> so you know, he he was just saying like, go after the guy you who did what? it. <laughs> right right <laughs> i mean at that point i feel like he'd be justified right but like that's not the point you know like dracula completely lost himself in his rage eventually you know the heroes they they get together and there's a lot of cool character development and they and they go and they beat dracula but the way they beat dracula is completely heartbreaking like oh my soul I cried i cried it's it's awful. It is not it is not a happy victory. It's not a happy end. Because like Dracula eventually uh Dracula's castle gets besieged by another vampire horse because of another vampire in the court conspiring against him for control. Like basically trying to topple his hold on on vampire society, right? Uh, and while that's happening, the the three heroes, the the you know the vampire hunter, the magician, uh, and and Alucard, right? They go, they raid the castle while that's happening, and they make their way to Dracula. Dracula is shown to just be crazy overpowered this entire time, like, and he's also implied to have not fed in a long time, like he's been going without blood for a long time. Which it means he's, he's weaker, right? But he's still just tossing. He's still just tossing these three around like it's nothing. After they just walked through an entire like, through an entire like army of vampires. Like they 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 portray his strength really well, and uh, eventually it gets to the point where he's just fighting Alucard because Alucard's the only one who can really keep up with them, and the fight eventually leads them into. Alucard's room, like his room as a child. And Dracula stops and he looks around and he's like, What have I done? I'm killing my boy. Mm. That hurt. When he said, like, I'm, 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 I'm killing my boy, I, I like it hurt me so bad. And, it, and, it's, and it's, it hurt even worse after that because he starts saying, I'm killing our boy, Lisa. And he's looking at like the picture on the back with Lisa. Like, oh, the fear oh, is that does not that sound good. So sad, honestly. Oh, that and, hurt it, really and, 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 and Dracula, Dracula just stops fighting and he just lets Alucard stake him. He just gra Alucard grabs a stake from his from his childhood post, like from his childhood bed post. He grabs the stake and he stakes his own bat. At that point, that's not. The heroes killing Dracula, that is Alucard killing his father. Worst family dinner ever. <laughs> you know, <laughs> why, why, why is he killing his own son if he's innocent? And, and, he's, and he's so young. Blind well, rage. Well, pure, pure blind, blind rage. rage. Alucard is trying to kill his father. And because he wants to kill humanity, and Dracula is not going to just like let him stop him, so he's going to like fight back, right? There, there's a yeah. And, and there, there's an exchange. <laughs> there's an exchange that Alucard has with his dad that is just completely like it perfectly encapsulates their perspectives on this. Very good. Very good. Thank you, Moises. I have made my case. I bow. Do we have any other volunteers? If not, you will be cho you will be chosen against your will. Uh, I'll go. I got none. Already. Go for it. Shut. Okay. Hello, listeners. Editing Xander here. Just wanted to make note uh, for this next segment going in about Black Manta. Uh, as Sam, aka Sharkboy, goes into um, 
into detail about this character, uh, extensively his backstory and stuff. I just want to make it very clear that the throughout this entire segment, he does kind of put himself into uh, the protagonistic role. So before anybody gets confused and uh, and starts scratching their head, wait, did, did this actually happen? No, no, it didn't. It didn't actually happen. It it's still a fictional story. Uh, it's just that Sam basically inserted himself into it. Don't think he meant to do that, but yeah, I guess he was just too excited to um, think about it. So I still found it entertaining. We we as a group still found it entertaining. Uh, just didn't want you, the audience, to be confused. So please enjoy uh, Sam's uh, description of Black Manta. Enjoy, guys. So Black Manta was technically... I'm going to start from childhood, if that's okay with you guys. So, as a child, he was born in Florida, basically. And during his birth, he was diagnosed, he was diagnosed with uh, some kind of a disorder, which is like insanity. And they tried to cure him, and they found a serum in the labs. It, it took over two years for the serum to be made. And the parents were told by the doctors either we cure him or he's going to go to the, an asylum. And the parents had no choice but to put the serum in him. And when they did, Black Manta went insanity even worse, which made his disorder way out of control. Because in the labs, one of the scientists accidentally put the wrong dose in the serum and due to the serum they had they had to put him in the asylum and he spent the past 20 years in the asylum until they let him go and then when he joined the military they denied him to his condition because he because the governor knew that he was going to be a big threat to himself and to many other people if he joined so they, so they decided to give him tests they tested him for for over six months straight, day, night, and day and night again, for twenty four hours. And when he passed the test, his disorder did not act out. Even though it was suspicious that either he was hiding it, or the serum might have actually worked. And and when he got into the military, he was sent on a mission in one of those mar in marine subs. And somehow, he did try to fight his way to become the captain of the sub. But, unfortunately, some runner-up actually won to become captain of the sub, which Black Manta became enraged. And when he became enraged, he planned out to kill the captain and everybody on board. And during the mission, he was sent to, to load up the torpedoes what he did, but what, but what the crew did not know was that Black Manta actually made it self-destruct for under two minutes. And when he was sent to the other side of the, of the sub to get another torpedo ready, he, had, he, did, he activated the trigger, what's called the explosion, when it got away in, those, in the um, escape pods. Killing all crew on board, and he was the only one who survived. And the crew never made it out alive. So when he returned to the base, the general asked him what what happened to the crew, and he explained to actually try to get away with it, which he did, but not for long until the investigation ended in a year. That one of the security cameras. One of those microchips was still was actually active, was, was not destroyed. So when, when they reviewed the footage, they realized that Black Mancha actually got enraged because he was the given captain of the sub. So after that, they kicked him out of the military, which they did arrest him. But somehow his insanity actually made him intelligent and he was able to escape a federal prison. And he and he also helped some inmates escape as well, which 
with all the inmates and him escaped, they somehow form a team along with along with his, his dad that try to make him get out of prison because of his condition. Instead of getting medical help, Black Man just decided to get his revenge for not being a captain. So what he did, he crafted out a submarine that shaped like a manta ray, painted black so it blends into the deep. And every single military ship that comes by, it shoots a torpedo that cannot be hit by either or other torpedoes to throw it off the track or use a different technology to make it blow up in midway. He sank almost half of all military ships. And then somehow, that's when I appeared that I floated his ship to the surface, damaging the engines. And he, and he said to his crew, you've been running to something? And then when his crew said, no, it looks like some kind of giant shark. And his father said, no, something hit us, which I did make a hole in the ship and the engine, which made it disabled, which they're unable to move. So when I broke in to save, to, um, to kill him, which I was sent by the, by the government, I found Black Manto waiting for me as an ambush. And he was down for a few moments until his dad, dad arrived and shot a spear gun running my back. Even though it did hurt, it didn't kill me. So I, so I threw a spear right back at his dad and right into the shoulder, which technically lead, lead to like a, a foot-long cold through his shoulder, unable to form to move. And Manta said, you bastard. And one of the, miss, one of the torpedoes fell on top of his dad's leg, which he wasn't able to move. And Manta said, please don't leave us. He needs help. And I said, you killed a bunch of innocent people. He was asked to seek for mercy. So when I left, it was just him and his dad and sub. So his dad told him he must leave and to live so he could kill me. So a black man just coming after me for revenge. And he's not going to stop until he was given captain. Damn. And, 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 and I'm going to try to make it a little shorter. So, And then somehow, he was not aware that his father was carrying a bomb in his hand. And he said, you need to go kill that son of a bitch. And he said, I'm not going to leave you. So he continued to get the torpedo off him, which is more than, it's more than two tons. Because why would you lift a two-ton torpedo if you know he can't move it? And somehow, his father said, I'm going to do it. And Black Man says, damn you. And then he had no choice but leave his father to die, even though the sub was sinking more than, more than 2,000 feet below. And he, even though there were some crew trying to, to sabotage the ship, the Manta ship, they, they were defenseless. So I put him on those light wraps and carried him back to the ships. And while Manta's ship was sinking, he escaped one of those pods. But one of the pods he was able to control, which I recently found out a few months later that he had an underwater base. And what he tried to do, he tried to pour some sludge onto the reefs, where basically where I lived. So all the fish were able to make it out alive just in time before all the reefs were killed off. So which means that all the um, aquariums like SeaWorlds in um, the land of Georgia, all the aquariums around the world decided to jump in and help out, which they did. And the reef was the reef was damaged, but the animals themselves were saved. And Manta continued to spread hatred around the seas until he was able to become captain, which technically he can't. And two years later, we meet again, but this time he had a plan to, I think it was somebody else i think he had a son or something but i'm not sure but somehow he forged an army of his own known as mentamin and one of the mentamin actually had a poison that could be fatal if it's hit in the right area which unfortunately for the mentamin were trying to kill me with the mist because i had some ocean conservation create hybrid humans who want to save the oceans alongside with me and it, it was a bloody war, but somehow Manta was defeated and he was arrested and charged. And he and he did escape again, but there's no sighting of him planning. And when his base was covered by the government, they 
they decided to make sure that they deleted every single file that Manta had, like all the military weapons, the subs, the ships, and everything. So it was all in the governor's hands. And Manta did try to sabotage everything, but it failed miserably. But he did say he will return again. But the question is, when? I see, I see. That was an interesting story that I did not know where to see it going. It takes a while, but hey, Black Manta will return. And when he does, I'll be ready. <laughs> what a psychological oh, yes, so. ride. Okay. Who's next? Up next. So what do you guys think? I, I think it was pretty good. That was great. I think that was yeah. very good. Do we have any other volunteers? That's bad. <laughs> All right, uh, I'll try to do my best, but there's over uh, 50, 24 hour days of content of this bitch. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Kind of. Uh, but uh, while everyone else kind of, uh, so far, everybody else's villain has, has kind of empathetic things about them. Uh, my, my character uh delilah she she was always a villain she she's the very first one of the very first things we learn about her is that she's part of this council of very very powerful mages and like pair very powerful mages are they are very corrupt and they're slowly like trying to take over this country basically but this this isn't the reason why she becomes an antagonist. No, she becomes an antagonist when her husband, her dear husband Silas, uh, becomes very ill very quickly, and um, she's she, and because this is like maybe the one good thing about her, she she absolutely adores her husband. She's a very good wife, and he's a very good husband. They love each other. It's great, kind of. But uh, she basically goes kind of crazy trying to save him and she hears this voice calling to her to like make a deal i can help you you help me we, we got this we can do this and she basically makes this deal with this undead god who's like trapped in in between worlds at the moment and she's just like okay uh, you bring my husband back i will bring you back to this realm as well so uh the, the undead god turns Silas into a vampire, and uh, Silas and Delilah uh, kind of abandon the council, at least for, for the moment, and they go to this city called Whitestone. Um, and they m absolutely murder, like, brutally murder the ruling, ruling family, and they're called the Dorellos. The Dorellos have, like, maybe seven eight kids and uh they, Wait, murder. they murder the whole family what do they murder the whole family Ev the whole family except for two of the kids cassandra and percy percy is a is one of the main characters from box machina which is you know why 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 the why delilah becomes a <laughs> becomes an ag antagonist because of Percy. Percy would not care at all about what Delilah was doing if he never uh, encountered them when, with Vox Machina. He would have just been continually on the run, just not caring about it. And uh, Cassandra was basically... Because she was around maybe 13 years old when, when her family was murdered. So she was basically taken in by the Briarwoods and slowly and methodically manipulated. Or not very slowly, just like vampirically manipulated into joining the Briarwoods. Which sucks. <laughs> Sorry. But, um, so Percy, Percy... Percy vows revenge. He literally makes a deal with the devil to make the gun. Like, the gun. He is the inventor of the gun in this universe. Hashtag totally not main character energy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Delilah and Silas, they they take over Briarwood and they... Not Briarwood. Uh, they take over Whitestone and basically shut down the city so nobody leaves. 
and what and Delilah like she she managed to bring bring giants or like she brings zombie giants back to life like they're not giant zombies they're zombie giants if that makes sense okay okay so so like so like they're giants who became zombies yeah not not just like oh they're zombies but big no they're they're giants who became zombies which means they're extra fucked up <laughs> but um one of the most vile things the most villainous thing she has done ever done uh matilda was in a group of seven of uh, people who could just look the part for a bit and what she does is that she forces this group of seven which by the way in this group of seven there are two children just keep that in mind there are two children in this group of seven and they basically oh, no. make them dress up as the main characters of the first campaign. Like, they dye their hair, they make them wear, like, shitty cosplays of them. And for Lana specifically, they cut her ears to be pointed because she's a human, but the, ca- the character that she was supposed to be is a half elf. So they literally cut the- her ears to be sharpened, and then they hung every single one of those seven characters on this giant tree in the middle of town so when this when the main characters from the first campaign campaign come into whitestone that is the first thing they see oh delilah briarwood took seven innocent people that just happened to look kind of like the main characters completely innocent have done nothing wrong and hung them from a tree that's brutal. That is Brutality. evil. Brutal. That is great. Yes, we're not done yet because she then she gets she gets really pissed off and basically like makes an entire army of zombies go after the main characters and just try and kill them. And she gets more and more and pissed off. There, but the, because protagonists are protagonists, they do manage to. Uh, defeat the Briarwoods, but not before. Uh, the first one they managed to kill is Silas because he's a vampire, which means he's he's. Uh, I can't think think of the word uh, right now, but he he does not like daylight. So one of the main characters like casts daylight on him and basically turns him into dust. And Delilah already on on the edge of insanity just fucking loses it and she manages to bring that undead god kind of back he is not completely back back yet but he is there is a basically this massive like ball of dark matter that that appeared and the main characters go oh that's not our problem to deal with right now and kind of just leave it (laughs) which is definitely a smart thing to do (laughs) but um as far as they're aware, but do this dark uh, matter, it seems, or wait, no. So the ki- they managed to kill, kill Delilah Briarwood, uh, and Percy uh, fights the devil that he made a deal with and uh, overcomes his trauma and gets his last remaining sister back. And it's all good and happy, at least for uh, a while. And it turns out, wait, no, Delilah's not dead. She's still working with that undead god. And she's pissed because the one thing, because there's there's a phrase that Deli- that's kind of ingrained with Delilah. And it's, um, I broke the world for us. Delilah, similar to, I suppose, Dracula in a way. She made a deal with a demon to get her husband back, and it turned out to be worth for nothing. So she, all that bitter angriness, that power-hungry pain that she has, she just turns it into spite and anger, and just tries her best to kill the protags, and she does not succeed, and people think, oh wait, no, she's dead. Nope. 30 years later, we get to campaign three, and my favorite character, Lana, who was the girl on the tree, and it turns out she's not dead because Delilah brought her back before she died. Or after she died, Delilah brought her back. 
30, 30 years later, we find out that Lana, the girl that was hung from a tree that Delilah killed and then brought back. Uh, so Lana, Lana is a warlock, which in D&D terms means, you know, you make a deal with something, they something, and they give you power, and that's what Delilah... Delilah is Lana's patron. The whole thing with them is you go, I go. And Delilah does not want to go, so she basically forces uh, Lana to stay exactly how she is the, from the moment she's died. She she has not technically aged in 30 years. She is technically not alive because, well, not exactly. She's she's not alive, but she's also not dead. It's confusing. And okay. death. Yeah, she's undead, kind of, I think. I'm not exactly sure. Lana's weird, and I adore her for it, but, um... But, so, uh, dead, but but not quite dead. Yeah. Which is funny, because I'm about to get to, uh, um... Uh, th- th- so, Lana dies because there's this bitch who kills her, but she's not important. Um... At least not at the moment. Lana dies, and the 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 pro tags of campaign three were like, "No, we're not letting her go just yet. We're going to fight to get her back." And it's basically they go to Whitestone, but now Whitestone. It's been thirty years. Uh, the the pro tags have fixed it up. It's now thriving. It is healed. It is all brand new and shiny. They go to Whitestone and say, hey, can you bring our friend back? The bitch that you killed a long time ago killed her, and I think it's only fair. But, you know, the the trauma that uh, Percy faced with Delilah, you know, that doesn't go away. So he's like, no, I'm not going to help you. Because if there is a single chance that bringing Lana back will bring Delilah back, he's not will- willing to ch- take it. So he, so they're like, no. But um, luckily, another one of the pro tags from campaign one was like, I will help you. Let's do this. And they basically go into this hellscape, this absolute hellscape that Delilah created for Lana, specifically for to to torture Lana. It's uh because, you know, being undead means Lana has not had a good representation with, or good is it representation? I can't think of the word. Reputation. That's what it is. Reputation with people. Like, mm-hmm. she's a monster, basically. And she has been thrown around, kicked around, ran out of homes, burned, stabbed multiple times. And ow, ow. Even, even before, like, the Briarwoods came, we see that she has not had the greatest life. I'm getting too much into Lana at the moment, but it's still, but, uh, like, she was bullied as a kid. Her parents were kind of neglectful, not because they were bad parents, just because they were, they were poor in a rich city, which means they had to work twice as hard as everybody else. So, um, Delilah tortured Lana with all of these memories and even trapping Lana within, within the tree that she was hung from, like a cage. Like, she trapped Lana within the thing that, you know, represents Lana's death. And that's fucked up. <laughs> right. Oh, fucked up. Right. oh, the loneliness. The, the yeah. loneliness yeah. and pain. Um, the, 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 Marisha, the person who plays Lana, was able to sit down at the table for, like, five seconds and just... The most heartbreaking conversation between Lana and her gal pal image. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to laugh. Uh, and her gal pal image, in, and, and it's just, it, just seeing and hearing that pain just sufficed my hatred for Delilah because she cannot just let go. She is holding on to that spite and that hatred for basically humanity at this point. You know, luckily, campaign three protagonists get her gone, but for me, it wasn't very a satisfying ending at the moment because Lana wasn't a part of that fight. She was more like, you know, 
the damsel and I don't want to say damsel in distress, but she was kind of that in that moment. And it didn't feel right to get rid of Delilah without Lana there, but that's a different thing. Um, so for a while, everybody thought, oh, Delilah's gone. Nope. Number four? Is this number count number four of Delilah not being gone? I don't know. So the party gets the campaign three people get split up and Lana meets this guy uh, who's who's a part of this cult, but he lied about not being a part of the cult. Basically, he tried to murder her and her friends, and she did this very specific spell, which in D&D, when you do specific spells, specific things happen. And with this spell, uh, because Lana has a very slow heartbeat, this spell makes her heartbeat go faster, but it's technically not her heartbeat. It's Delilah's. Oh, no. Oh, so when Lana used this spell to kill kill this uh, traitor, this liar, um, she brought back Delilah, and she is now very distraught about it. But they can't Hi. really do anything about it at the moment because there isn't because the Red Moon is pissed off, mm-hmm. and um, that yeah. that that is. For the moment, the story of Delilah Briarwood. She just oh. won't fucking die. <laughs> Holy shit. Delilah's an evil bitch. Yeah. Yeah. She is. Oh God damn. David actually <laughs> killed me. God damn. Hello. You think you killed me? Reverse no, reverse no card. <laughs> <laughs> Ready for more pain and suffering? Apparently so. I'm doing it again. Oh boy. She basically woke <laughs> up and chose violence. I hear can do it again. Bro, you're gonna send death, you're gonna send death my way. I got I got I got resurrects on speed dial, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta I gotta get on a death three card here. Okay, go on. <laughs> do we have any other volunteers before I sacrifice you all? <laughs> Alex? <laughs> so, as I said before, my character is Regina Mills, who inherently is actually the evil queen. Now, the evil queen has a backstory of herself, much like Dracula, except she seems, appears to be much older. Because her story was written in 1812, while Dracula's story was written in 1897. But they're both the concepts Aww. have been around for a prior time, like they're both ideas. The Brothers Grimm went around the world collecting stories, so we actually have no idea how old uh, Snow White's story is. And same idea with like Dracula as well, because like the concept of vampires has probably been around longer than we think. So I like to think that my my character's history also has a very rich history as well as Dracula's. Going back to the Evil Queen. She is portrayed in so many different movies, so many different TV shows. I mean, it, it is amazing just all the ways she was portrayed. I mean, there's like, let's see, I have it pulled up here on some, on a tab. Uh, adaptations. So there was like Snow White. There's multiple different types of Snow White movies, like, like lots of silent films. Like from 1902, 1916. Uh, there is The Seven Dwarfs to the Rescue, a 1951 Italian film. Um, there's, I don't know how to pronounce this one because like, it's a different language, but like, it finished. Uh, Snow White and the Seven Dudes, 1953. Uh, there's also a German live action from 1955. 1955 from Hong Kong. It's like it goes back from like all over. It's a worldwide like gospel love. Everybody loves the story. So therefore, Evil Queen is through all of that. It's through all of like its adaptations. I mean, there's uh, Mirror Mirror, uh, Snow White, the uh, which I had it up. What happened to my? The I think it I was. I think you're referring to the one Snow White and the Huntsman. Yeah, Snow White and the Huntsman. I that's what I was thinking of. But I don't yeah. remember what it's called, but there's this one where she and the dwarves basically become like Robin Hood. 
and his gang, but like led by Snow White. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's Mirror Mirror. That's Mirror Mirror. That's Mirror Mirror. Yeah, there's a movie like. Uh, which which red shoes? Like it was yeah, red shoes and seven dwarfs. That was uh, another basically a Snow White adaptation that also has an evil queen in it. Like the concept of an evil queen, the evil queen in general, which is so full of rich history, but always comes back to apples. There's always some form of an apple or a, like a sign of red, like an apple. And that's what I kind of find intriguing about it. But anyways, on to my show with Regina Mills as the Evil Queen. Her history in this show is very interesting. And she's actually a very redeemable character. In fact, in later seasons, we see her slowly start to redeem herself and is no longer known as the Evil Queen. But her backstory, oof, it's very intricate and actually very painful in a way to where, like, emotionally painful. Because her mother is Cora, who is also known as the Miller's daughter from uh, another well known fairy tale, Rumpelstiltskin. So she's the woman that's been drawn to gold and is quite interesting to see how this show brings all fairy tales together one way or another and the way that regina grows up under Cora's thumb it's like she's being controlled she has no choice of her own her mother cora wants her to be queen her name means queen in fact uh one of the let's see I had it here somewhere. Where's her name? Where's her name? Where's her name? Um, yeah. Cora Lu- uh, Cora's name in Latin origin means queen, but um, Cora alludes to this meaning when she names her newborn daughter Regina and states, for one day she will be queen in the episode of The Miller's Daughter. She has these huge plans for her daughter to be better than she was because she wants to live vicariously through her. So she puts all this pressure on Regina to be perfect, to marry a prince from a kingdom that way she can be queen. And it just, Regina's a very free spirit as she grows up. She does not want to be tied down. She wants to, she loves horseback riding. She loves feeling the wind in her hair. You know, she's a typical teenage girl, right? But, and she falls in love with a stable boy of all people, and it's so adorable, and it's like a, like a true, it's like a love story of all time. But one fateful day when Regina was out for her riding lessons, Snow White's horse is riding through them after, uh, after when we learn later in the series that Cora spooked just because she wanted Regina to have the chance to meet the queen, the king, and in his favor but yeah regina saves snow white basically cora's plan comes to fruition the king proposes to regina saying like how he can see how he cares for his daughter and that how she still needs a mother after her mother died you know typical stuff you know regina's like no i'm sorry but i don't want this i'm already in love with somebody else she plans on running away with her love from the saber boy daniel which is very turns out to be very unfortunate (laughs) for lack of better words because snow white who thinks regina is gonna be her new mother because she takes a huge liking to her of course because you know she's an eight nine year old girl right but she catches regina and daniel in the stable like kissing and talking about running away together and marrying and so after regina notices snow witnessed that she goes after snow to uh to say you cannot tell my mother about this she is a horrible woman yada 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 basically uh but she basically long story short snow tells Cora because she because Cora manipulates snow because Cora is very good at manipulation but Cora manipulates snow into telling her what uh regina has said and 
when Cora finds out that she Regina plans to run away with Daniel, she pretends to accept it when the night that Regina runs away is start planning to run away, grabs his heart from his chest when Daniel assumedly like goes to hug Cora as like a thank you to letting her, uh, Regina run free. Like grabs his heart, crushes it in front of Regina, causing him to just drop dead in front of him, in front of her. And it's just the emotional trauma that Cora has put on her own daughter. It is scary, and anyone would go mad. Anyone would want to be just like want to like destroy the world after that because you know she lost her love. But you know she stays strong because she I doesn't. See where you Back to my vibes. Mm-hmm. Huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a long time standing story in general. Yeah. So, Gina marries King as plan because it's her mother's wish. Her mother is literally forcing her to marry the king. And it is just a lot of emotional trauma for Regina. But as so Regina is getting fitted, fitted for her wedding dress, Snow let, lets it spill that she didn't keep the secret that she to- that she promised to keep. She lets it spill that she told her mother, the very person she told Snow not to tell, that she was running away with Daniel, that she's in love with Daniel. And so, of course, Regina's shocked, but she turns away to hide her shock, just to spare Snow feelings. You know, it's a very admirable quality of a hero. In a way, but it's just like all this rage, all this pent up frustration, and all the trauma that she has dealt with up to now. Like, she's like 16, 17 year old girl at this point. She's like eight or nine years older than Snow, which is ridiculous. Yeah. If you think about it. But, like, the fact that she's held out this long was very impressive. Her father, uh, Regina's father, like, tells uh, her there's something of or is, like her mother's that she could steal to, like stop her mother once and for all not knowing it was a book that Rumpelstiltskin gave to Cora when he was teaching her magic and so she accidentally uh, summons Rumpelstiltskin and they have a huge talk talk because you know Rumpelstiltskin is a very crafty character and you know he conjures a mirror that would transport unknowingly her mother to wonderland if she is pushed through that mirror so lo and behold Cora shows up to see uh, her daughter in her wedding dress and she goes to unwrap the mirror i'm like oh this is a bit tacky you should deserve you need, you need a better gift you are queen you're going to be queen you need to earn the respect and talking about all this pressure and like putting even more pressure on her daughter to be better than what she is, because I mean, there's or what she imagines her daughter to be. And so Regina gets enough of it and actually push like after seeing Ruffles still skin like reflection in the mirror to like push her mother. She does it because she wants to be free from her basically tyrant of a mother. But little does she know that's just a path to darkness. Uh, but. As we see through this, the her backstory, Regina is just she wants revenge. She's not happy with her life. She's not happy being King Leopold's wife. She's not happy being Snow's stepmother because every day she's there, she's reminded of her mother. She was reminded of what Snow did. What how Snow was the reason that Daniel is basically dead. So she is just harboring all this resentment inside of her, and it's just, it builds and builds. And so she asks Rumpel to teach her magic, too. Like, she doesn't want to harm anybody. Throughout most of this, she's like, I don't want to harm anybody. I just want to protect myself. I want to get away from here. And, you know, Rumpel kind of abides by that. But there was, there was just this one straw that finally broke Regina Mills, and I can't remember what it is, but like something broke her ultimately, and she's like, you want, you want your evil queen? Well, here she is, goes into this assistant that Ruffles Stilson has, grabs his heart, takes it out, and crushes it, and just does this little hand motion to like, as she's dropping this 
crumpled heart. And that's like the start of like the reign of the evil queen where she just learns like black magic, she learns blood magic, and just like all these types of magic that is, can be seen as evil. And you know, it's as she plans for the death of the king, as she earns her as she hunts down snow for um like after she chases snow out of the castle after the king's death. She frames snow for like treason and robbery and all these things that are not true. And but really, she's just she's still that scared little girl inside. She just wants to be happy. That's all this is about. She wants to be happy and she thinks her vengeance against snow will make her happy. But, um. Fast forward through the series a little bit, because I know we still got, like, multiple people to go through. Uh, she enacts a curse that brings everybody from the land that she's in uh, to our world, the, the real, what we call the real world, and creates a little town called Storybrook. Ironic, isn't it? And um, she creates where everything is her way. She makes pe everybody that we all know and love to just ordinary people and at first she's happy because like you know no one knows like what happened in their land she's the only one that remembers besides Rumble Siltoon because he had a safety measure and stuff because he knew exactly what she was gonna do you're gonna have to watch the show if you really want to know what's actually happening <laughs> but um she at first she feels happy. She thinks she's won. But then she gets like this empty feeling inside of her because everybody does the same thing every single day. It's like the same. It's like pressing a restart button on a day. You're living the same day every day. And it gets old, right? So Regina goes looking to set for something to fill a hole. A baby, right? So she has from the skills and or aka Mr. Gold to find her a baby to adopt. She adopts what we all know later the save, to be the savior's son because you know savior's in prison but you know you again you have to watch the show if you want to know what I'm talking about but uh, she just stops Henry and you know she actually feels kind of good about herself because like she doesn't feel as lonely as she did it's like she has something to dull that ache that was there but Fast forward even more through the series, um, her son's uh, birth mother comes into town after her son actually goes out looking for her because he knows the town is cursed. He has a book that has randomly appeared about all these stories of the people in this town and their land. And, you know, she is threatened by his birth mother, who is Emma Swan, the savior. And... You know, Emma just is sticking around to make sure everything's okay because, you know, why would the kid come search her out, right? Well, Regina is acting like her evil queen self. She wants to chase her out of the town. She wants everything to be back to normal for her normal. And she just wants it back to where she is the victor and there's nothing to like stand in her way. Throughout this series, we see her pull some very questionable acts. We see her uh, manipulate people and like she used what little magic she has left to just make things happen to where she wants it. But throughout the series, everyone views her as evil. She is the mayor of the town, so but in their in their own little made up well, their made up world in our world. <laughs> I don't know if I'm making any sense, but like she, she is just this very scary head of authority. She is this person that everybody fears and they don't know why. Once Emma breaks a curse though, Regina gets her magic back and that's even more scary because like she can make anything happen at her own will and you know, she still commits acts of the evil queen because she just wants her son. That's all she wants. She wants her son. She wants her happy ending. And she thinks the only way she to do that is by force. But fast forward 
Henry convinces Regina to not use magic to, to actually try and be good. You know, Regina actually does try. She does try to be good just for Henry, for her son. And, you know, she does. She, yeah, she falls into old habits, but she is one of the few, like, antagonists that I've seen that actually has very redeemable qualities and is redeemed. She redeems herself and is no longer known as the evil queen. She's just known as the queen. It's like, even when she was, like, removed from power, uh, Snow White and her Prince Charming always still referred to her as queen. Like, always... And I always thought of that as them still giving uh, her power over them. I always thought that was like a little symbolism fact from the series. But like, she always had some sort of power. But like, the fact that love, being loved and being a chance to prove that she is good, from the people around her, from Snow White, from Prince Charming, from uh, Henry's adoptive mother, Henry's birth mother, from the people that she cursed to be shown love, to be shown an actual family, to find a love herself with someone else after the heartbreak and trauma she went with Daniel. It's just amazing of how much character growth and development went through the series, how much thought went into her character specifically, and how like she just grew. And so like that's why she's with one of my favorite antagonists, because like she's just she actually had redeeming qualities. She fought for her family once she was like, once she was no longer seen as an evil queen. She fought for Henry. She fought for the town. She was willing to sacrifice herself all in name of protecting the people she loved because she knew that she could not live without Henry. She could not live knowing that she lost every single person she cared about because she lost her mother she lost her father she lost um all of her loves she's lost uh, robin hood she's lost daniel she's lost so many people and the fact that she was able to at least protect one person that she loves henry i think henry is honestly the true hero of this series because he in retrospect, saved everybody just by bringing, he was the glue of the series in a way, because she, he brought back Emma, he, he was the one that always persisted, and be like, no, we gotta do this, this is what is right, he's the one that, kept, that brought Regina, who was originally good, she originally had a good heart, she never wanted to hurt anybody, who turned bad, because, you know, trauma, and death, and but the fact that, like, there was always a reminder that she was basically antagonized every single day. She, he brought Regina back to the side of life. He brought her back to where she knew what love felt like again. She, he made her see the best qualities in her, like, truly beautiful character development and story. And I... As confusing as the series can be, once you put it all together, you realize just just the amount of effort and work that went into all of these character developments and plots. And honestly, the character that grew the most in the series was Regina Mills. And that's why she's my favorite antagonist. I see. Alrighty then. That was... A story yeah, that, 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 was that was amazing. That, that, that's a story you know, be, be told. If I do yes. remember correctly, I have seen this show, and then the person that, you know, made her draw her final straw was actually the death of her father. Oh, yeah, because she, yeah, she had to kill her father in order to enact the curse. Yeah, she thought she could do her prized deed in order to act the curse, but no, it has to be someone you truly love. So she killed her own father to enact the curse because she thought this revenge would bring her happiness. That's how far she went. That's how far of an evil queen she was. But, you know, she was redeemed. But yeah, her, like, 
history of the evil queen in general just goes so far back and i kind of find it funny that it's farther back than um dracula's because after he talked about dracula moises i looked at that because i knew uh the grim fairy tales have been along since like the 1800s and i know dracula was as well so i'm like which one's older <laughs> they're technically by book standards uh snow white is but the concept has been around for who knows who knows how long. That was a lot. <laughs> James, I'm assuming you want to go next. Yes. Oh boy, let's, let's wrapping wrap everybody. Alex's, right. <laughs> let's wrap up Alex's part and then I'll start. <laughs> All right, try to keep. Don't wait to hear what you got for us. Try, try, try to keep it yeah. under twenty minutes. Because <laughs> right now, according... that's my question. What? How long did I go? Um, if I'm reading Only the thirty minutes at this point. If I'm reading yeah. the time right, that was at least a thirty-minute uh, section. Because <laughs> shark started at like the forty-minute mark. Uh, we're, yeah. at a, we're at an hour and 40 minutes right now, so if I do the math correctly, you started at the hour and 20 minute mark. Uh, so it's like... like she started more minutes. around the 20... Uh, like the 30 mark. Because I, yeah. I tried to end it before. Like I, just, I, I ended around like 25. Yeah, the only, sure. yeah, the only, re hour, God damn. only reason I'm, I'm trying to keep it like Minimal is because there's so many of us. You know, don't want to, don't want to bore the audience. Still have too much. three more people to go through, so try to keep it short and concise. So, <laughs> okay, remember the 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 great giants, the Giganticus Lupicus, right? How they disappeared like ten thousand years ago. Yeah. Okay. Well, in one thousand seven hundred sixty-nine BE. So many thousands of years later, the Forgotten arrive in Tyria. The Forgotten are a group of like ancient snake-like beings that stand upright. And then this part has been lost to history. We don't know when, but at some point the Char arrive and they fight the Forgotten and win. And so now they control the entire eastern side of the continent from the Shiver Peak Mountains all the way to the East Coast. They are aggressive, industrious, and wholly dedicated to becoming the preeminent species of Tyria. Uh, they'll use any means available to destroy their enemies. An ambush is as honorable as a fair fight, as victory is what matters. The Char have no concept of mercy, but they can be protective of those within their own tribe. Long after uh, the Forgotten were beaten, there was a single Char who rose above the rest. The Khan Ur. Name is lost to time. But the Khan Ur unites all the warbands into one nation. And then the humans appear. And with the help of their gods, they push the char into this little restricted area called the Northlands and they build a giant wall called the Great Northern Wall. And then they assassinate the, the Conner. So now the char are without a leader. His, the Conner's four children became known as Imperators and established the High Legion. The Ash Legion, the Blood Legion, the Flame Legion, and the Iron Legion. In, in their quest to find a way to beat the humans and reclaim their land, they seek gods to call their own. And at a volcano called Harangmer, I'm not gonna say, I'm not gonna claim to know how to pronounce this, they discovered gods, not really. But they discovered gods. And now, with gods, the shaman caste unites and starts uniting the rest of the warband under this faith. One 
Char, Bathia Havokbringer, rejected the new gods. She was quickly executed as a living sacrifice, and the shaman caste banned all the female Char from warbands and armies, sent, and they were sent to do utility work. I'm assuming it's because after this, they saw the females as, like, people who will f fight too much against them, and so they oppressed them. It's basically what I'm getting. Anyway, their gods gave them the Cauldron of Cataclysm, which allowed them to cast a spell called the Ritual of the Searing, which caused dark magic crystals to fall out of the sky and destroy. <laughs> this is what this is what causes the searing event, where the water turns to disgusting muck. The ground is now ash. Hundreds of not thousands of innocent lives are lost. That's what starts the whole thing. Anyway, they they tend to get new gods, and now they're being taken control of from the inside because they. Some of them found gods, aren't gods. And um, then we can hear that. Uh, whoever is doing that. It was Vesper. Hi. I do. Um, there's, there's there is a, a war band that is dedicated to taking down the shaman caste. Guess, guess what? The, the shaman's grip was weakening because, you know, these gods weren't exactly helping them too much because they weren't gods. And so now, remember the destroyers from last week? Yeah. They're now hailing the destroyers as their new gods. The destroyers, the race of grotesque creatures that want to, like, just eradicate the planet. They're hailing them as gods. They <laughs> they take the destroyers and they're like, go kill them. And the destroyers just turn around and attack them instead. And then <laughs> one of the chars just like, he, he just tells everyone to remember this day and continue to spread the word that there are no gods for the char. So by the end of this, the char no longer believe even God, period. <laughs> They've been taken control of from the inside by this fanatic group who've claimed two separate entities as gods and gotten attacked by both of them. <laughs> so, eventually, at the, at the end of the story and everything, they ha technically have their homeland back from the humans of Ascalon. They also no longer believe in gods at all. Yeah, that's why they're not exactly villain. Because, sure, they kind of, like, wanted to be the preeminent race and wanted to control all the land and stuff, but they didn't exactly deserve being completely pushed into the a restricted area and having their leader killed and then being taken control of from the inside by, you know, their own. I'm just gonna end it here. I see, I see. And like that, you you went from uh, the longest to the shortest among us. <laughs> yeah, <that's cool. laughs> Interesting enough. Last week. <laughs> hey, you told me to try make it short. That's fair. We mm -hmm. did. We did. I can go. I can go on. I can go on. <laughs> Just don't, I'll, take no, no, I'll take it. I'll take it. Pretty interesting. That's still interesting, to say the least. Yeah, it's still really interesting. For sure. Is everybody? Has everybody gone to the bathroom? Has everybody gotten their water? Is everybody good? Yeah. yeah I'm good. Sure. I drink too much water for this shit. <laughs> <laughs> I might have to go to sleep. Please. Oh my goodness, I feel. Yeah, that's what we do. You know, Rusty. Yeah, we'll we'll do you yeah. first, so that way you can go to bed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's either that or you can opt out of the podcast, but I don't think you want to do that. Do you want to do that? No, right now. I, I got. I got too much to cook with. No. Okay. Go ahead. All right. We'll let Rusty go. Hold on. Okay. Three, two. Ooh. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's, it's my turn, I guess. Uh, hold on a second. Uh, I'm like prepared for this. Uh, hold on a second. I'm sharing it with my with the oh. audience in the Discord. Oh. Uh, oh. Ooh, oh how PowerPoint and everything. Hire my me. Favorite, uh, <laughs> my favorite antagonist, or why I need a job by Rusty Hades. Hey guys, editing Xander here again. I uh, just wanted to let you guys know that in this section, uh, Rusty here has a um, a PowerPoint presentation for us. So unfortunately, you guys can't see it, but we can. But everything that's on there is uh, being said. So you guys aren't missing too much. But this is a this is in fact a PowerPoint presentation prepared by Haiti uh, Rusty Hades. He's a uh, this this is the second time he's done this. Uh, Go back and watch the first episode, or uh, listen to the first episode, I should say, so that way you do, uh, you can get some of the context. But uh, let's get back to Sweet Tooth. Enjoy. Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> because I, I really like the vibe of Sweet Tooth. You can be like in like a silly, goofy mood the uh, the first time in his early, like his earlier in um, earlier uh, appearances, <clears throat> where he was just like a really it's just an insane man in the clown suit in the ice cream truck that was like possessed by the devil or something and uh he's just very wacky and then in his later incarnations he's this terrifying being of pure evil uh that uh that is just like full of hate and malice and and there's like one storyline where he has to like find uh his like daughter that he's going to try to kill because he did, yeah. Because she escaped him years back after he tried to kill his family. This is an entire thing. He also one incarnation of uh, Sweet Tooth killed the dog because it got more spotlight than him because he was on like a a TV show. Uh, it was like a sitcom. Yeah, that was in the show, not in the games. But he is a very, very crazy individual here. Uh, Oh dear. Boy, he, uh, he cares a lot about Harold, his paper bag friend. He won that first Twisted Metal tournament. Uh, in the second, he wanted to become like a tiny little bug in like a backyard. Uh, it, it's ranging from a lot of things. Uh, the third, uh, third game, uh, he wanted to eat as much ice cream as he wanted. Uh, and throughout the reboot and the Twisted Metal tournament, Twisted Metal that is now, he just wanted to murder people because it's fun for him. Also, he has a flaming head. His head is always on fire. Blah, blah, blah. There As yeah. one does. Yeah. Uh, the interesting thing about Sweet Tooth is that he's the face of, uh, of Twisted Metal, and he's also kind of the protagonist and antagonist of it because he is super evil, and everyone knows it, and then he kind of just like, he's like relevant to every to like every Twisted Metal tournament. Uh, he hosted one in Twisted Metal 4. He was the host and granted people's wishes uh, for that. Uh, uh, he's not a hero. He's like a mass murderer, uh, mass murdering clown person uh, who is built like a tank and is and can kill a guy with like a name tag from like far away. He threw it at a guy and just like hit him in the head and just he was done. Uh, he was, he, uh, hold on, hold on a second. Tylenol's kicking my butt right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, he got no cursed worries. by a preacher, preacher one time, but yeah. that might have not, not been real because, uh, one game called Twisted Metal Black takes place in Sweet Juice Head and how he sees the Twisted Metal Tournament and the world around him. And it's very dark. Uh, you should play Twisted Metal Black to get insight on this on this dude right here because oh my goodness it is it's kind of messed up for sweet tooth a little bit uh give more insight play twist him out of black uh he also has an ice cream truck mech uh you know uh, sweet bot yeah he can fire missile missiles and the head can come off and go through walls and blow up people little references at the bottom for ice cream man and evangelion you know 
his rival in the PlayStation multiverse is Kratos for some reason. Uh, a god killer versus a man who loves ice cream and murder, which is insane. That is hilarious. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's just great. That's that's yeah. just great. And somehow the beef started with Kratos accidentally hitting uh, Sweet Tooth's ice cream cone, and they started to fight over it. And really? Said, yeah. Yeah, even Kratos in his version of the event said, like, oh, that was an accident. And Sweet Tooth and all that, and they just started just to fight. Just just because. Uh, also, he was voiced by Will Arnett in the show and was played visually by the wrestler Samoa Joe. Uh, if you don't knew, know who Will Arnett is, he was Lego Batman and also Bojack Horseman. Uh, oh, hell yeah. Yeah. And nice. Also, I'm going to plug some stuff because I, I just need to go. Go really quickly. Uh, so, follow me on Twitch. I have not streamed in months. Please help me. And also, Twitch.tv. Rusty Hades had to do a shameless plug there. That's about it. <laughs> uh, I'm going to... Uh, that's it. <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. Make sure to subscribe yeah. to my buddy, uh, Rusty Hades, on Twitch. Shameless plug. I'm sorry. Shameless plug. Hey, hey don't, don't, don't feel bad about it. Right. It was good. Lovely. <laughs> it was really good. You that did lovely. <laughs> I was just like, I need to absorb this information and yeah, the images are know. also Hold kind of like getting too everything. much. It's like too much. It's just so much. I am much better at, I'm better at spouting out tons of information the other people have pro Brom's processing than I am at absorbing the same amount or more information. I feel that. I feel that. It yeah. seems like Sweet Tooth woke up and chose violence. That's that's the vibe. <laughs> yes, me. his bed is just <laughs> pretty much. Uh... Honestly, uh, oh. every uh, every iterance of Sweet Tooth's like uh, appearance, uh, uh, just like his story, he always comes out of an asylum. Asylum, just like because that's where he feels like at home, and he's just like he just breaks out just because he wants to. Yeah, that, that's yes, sir. yes, sir. Uh, any questions before I before I have to go to sleep? Like I'm feeling, feeling. Um, I only have one question for you, Rusty. Yes. Are you with the sauce? <laughs> <laughs> I am. You could say I'm goaded with the sauce. Uh... <laughs> with the sauce. I'm... That that was the correct answer. I, I want everybody in this call to know that was the correct answer. <laughs> All there really is to it. <laughs> basically, Rusty's basically Rusty's bad guy is just. I want to eat ice cream and kill. What <laughs> <laughs> oh Do you need Wait, more information? That is the simplest. That is the Wait, simplest so. way you can play. <laughs> yep. Wait. So you're saying yes? Wake Relatable. up, eat ice cream. So it's. Wake up, eat ice cream, kill, repeat. Yes. Sounds right. Relatable. <laughs> it needs Wait, to be it needs to be a tattoo. It's like eat ice cream, kill, repeat, and it's just like an ice cream cone. <laughs> with the words around it. That just needs to be a wall wake sign up, that you can hammer in. Just ice cream, murder. Alright, alright, alright. Let's get to the next person. Night Risky. Yoshi, would you like to uh, sleep be our well. next? Right. Yes, yes, later. I was I waiting go. for this. I did my research. Oh, I wrote a clip and I got it done. One, one last I'm thing before you go. I'm going to bed, you guys. Alright, Shark Stock, I'm going to bed. Okay, one thing, one thing before you go, Rusty. Yes. Eat ice cream when you get up. You got the good stuff. Do it. All right. Well, thanks for with you guys in, in spirit and watching the podcast when it comes out. Good night. Yes, yes. Make sure you leave a like, we everybody. You. <laughs> we'll uh, comment, like, uh, subscribe, you know, all uh, that stuff. Of course, all <laughs> yeah, the stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thanks for letting me share you guys. No problem, buddy. Okay. So, you know, I I sweated, I bled, 
I threw up like a sick. I was just researching this topic because I found it really interesting, and I finally came up with one of my favorite antagonists. Are you okay? <laughs> so my favorite antagonist is the Joker. Um, I was going to go with one specifically, and that would be the Dark Knight, the Joker, but I decided to just go with the overall Joker. Uh, so no offense to Joaquin Phoenix, but I think the best portrayal of the Joker goes to the late great Heath Ledger's performance in The Dark Knight. So, all right. All right. Heath, Heath, Ledger, Heath Ledger's Dark Knight is, or Heath Ledger's Joker is just absolutely iconic. I don't, I don't blame you it in the slightest. I've seen on the cake. It is everything. It gave me everything and more. So, right. when you. Xander, you gotta do the Joker laugh now. <laughs> nah, well, I'll save that for the end. I want to, I want to hear Yoshi's take. Okay, okay. The Dark Knight has captivated all of us since the first appear in two thousand and eight. It has captivated us. It has entertained us for hours on end. And sure, Jack Nicholson's Joker in Burton's nineteen eighty eight Batman was entertaining and silly, but. Like I mentioned before, Heath Ledger's portrayal of the character, he just grabbed it and took it to a completely different level. Like, he was creepy, he was dangerous, he was psychotic, but he was also super smart. So it begs to ask me the question, what makes him a great villain and what makes him one of my favorite antagonists? So... When you think of, like, villains, you think of, like, different stories, you know, how, like, hero is never truly in danger, and, yeah, they get beaten up, they get bruises, and all of that, but the hero always comes out on top. Well, the Joker brings tension. They bring real tension to the Batman stories, whether that be on the comics, on the big screen, on shows, on everything. Back to the Dark Knight, in the first few minutes of the movie, the Joker kills other characters through, uh, during a robbery without any hint of remorse, uh, which sets the tone for the entire movie. So the Dark Knight is not just about, you know, it's not just about a movie about the hero Batman, it's a movie about the Joker. Like, it's, I'm expressing that how it is. It is a movie about the Joker. It, It's just... I don't know how to explain how much I love the Dark Knight and especially Heath Ledger's Joker. It's just they did magnificent with that. Um, I'm trying to simplify this because I did write a lot about this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so to put it simply, the Joker is unlike any other villain ever made. His signature cackle paired with that crazy, chaotic, and sinister plans as to its universal appear. Appeal, I'm sorry. So, the Joker is a great example of an antagonist. Is that he gains the sympathy of the audience when you look at him. He was not born evil, but he became evil due to his life's events. And in spite of this, he remains the type of antagonist the villain type of antagonist um, because of the way he interacts with the hero. Um, In a way, the Joker always seems to have the upper hand in his menacing laughter following Batman's throughout different adventures and stories. But all of hold on, I wrote it down. So I I don't know how to simplify this, but I wrote a lot. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So I put a few points that yeah. If I was to help you, I believe that the Joker represents escalation. That that is yes. that is basically what the the prompt for the end of Batman Begins was. Is that it was all about escalation and how things got things would just ramp up crazier and crazier. Mm. So I simplified it down to a few simple points of what I think makes the Joker just a great villain. Um, point one would be that he is scary despite having no superpowers. Um, you know, like other villains that we see in the Batman comics or movies or shows, we have like 
characters like Mr. Fee, Mr. Freeze or Poison Ivy, who all have superpowers that kind of help them, you know, defeat the hero and all of that. But the Joker doesn't. He just does what he does because he he's strong. He doesn't need any superpowers to prove that. He doesn't need the money to prove all of this. Um, the second point would be that you cannot reason with him. Um, a great example of this would be one of the codes from Heat Ledger's Joker that would deliver um, in the movie. And it goes, I'm like a dog chasing cars. I wouldn't know what to do if I got one, you know, I just do things. So you can't really reason with him because even if he did, he would just go and do whatever he wanted. He doesn't. So my third point would be so he doesn't want to kill the hero. The Joker sees Batman as like a yang to his yin. So like a two sides of a coin kind of thing. There is a quote that I wrote here that also comes from Heat Ledger's Joker that goes, This is what happens when an unstoppable force meets a movable objects. You are truly incorruptible, aren't you? You won't kill me or sound misplaced senses of self-righteousness. And I won't kill you because you're too much fun. I think you and I are destined to do this forever. And then I don't know if you guys ever seen the cartoon Batman's when I don't know where Batman was doing or what was happening with him. But the Joker actually got bored because Batman wasn't around to fight him and everything. He just didn't want to fight anybody else. He wanted to fight just Batman. He just wanted to, in his way, spend time with him. You're um, thinking The Dark Knight Returns. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So. Yeah. yeah. So. Joker's like, I only want to fight Batman thing. The Lego Batman movie. Yeah. Oh, that was funny. Hmm. For the um, Bronze there Age Joker content, no technically, that's where that main idea of Joker is Batman's yang comes from the Silver Age of comics. Yes. Mm-hmm. Nice. Not uh, the silver, the bronze. <laughs> my bad. The silver, so, silver, silver Age is fun, goofy, goofy Joker. You know, <laughs> the, the one where you can't take him too seriously, but, you know, he's still a villain. That's the... Um, so, I have three more points to make. So, the other point would be um, that even other villains fear him but like it just comes down to they fear him because of his insanity and he's really unpredictable like you never know what the joker has up his sleeves and you never really know what he does most of the time he's like a wild card he does anything to hurt uh if you read the comics he has beaten up jason todd which was one of the former robins to near dead with a crowbar, shot Gordon's daughter and wife, and almost killed Tim Drake, which was another Robin. And my last and final point of why he's just a great villain is his sense of style. Like, he is a style icon. He is a style queen. No matter what, he is like, he has, I don't know how to say it, but the fact that His outfits are just so iconic, and no matter what version of Batman it is, it's just great. There is an an episode of the animated series where uh, the mayor is comparing Batman to the Joker, and Joker's watching, and he's just like, What? Compare me to Batman? I got more style, more brains! (laughs) I'm certainly a better dresser. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, those are my... In simple terms, reasons of why I think the Joker makes just a great, you know, villain. Anybody? Right. <laughs> my favorite Joker is Lego Batman's Joker, so like I'm not, I'm not valid in this conversation. <laughs> are, you, are you talking about the games or no, no, the, the movie, movie, the movie, the movie. <laughs> as long as. Uh... <laughs> As so, long, as long as we end the the topic, whoever we... pays his tax, <laughs> who always pays his tax, it's not that. <laughs> Just as long as we don't talk about the one Joker that, ugh, 
It was just Jared Leto. No, 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 no. We, we don't, we don't, we don't, don't mention, don't mention the. All right, Zayner, talk Zayner. about your dinosaur. I want to hear you talk about your dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have a dinosaur in the room. We got a dinosaur in the room. Yoshi's found a joke. Yoshi's found a Joker and given it the chef's kiss. That's all. Mm-hmm. Let's just keep it there. <laughs> all right, so. <laughs> Uh, to talk about the Indominus Rex, I do have to go into a little bit of backstory with the hybrids in Jurassic in general, because believe it or not, the hybrids were not that new of a thing. It's just that they were never put into the movies. They were actually a line of toys called Chaos. Uh, I believe it was the Chaos Effect uh, series, but they had a bunch of different hybrids that they were going to be releasing. They never did, unfortunately. But one of them was the Ultimasaurus, which... <clears throat> There's actually a, a Goji Center video about that if you guys want to go check it out. It's really, really cool. But believe it or not, the Indominus actually had some production issues before they settled on a finished product. The original name for the Indominus was going to be the Diabolus Rex. But they decided against it because they were afraid of religious backlash. Because it's like, oh, <laughs> the devil dinosaur? Oh, how dare you do such a thing? It's like, it, it was either it was either oh, that or God. it was either that or uh, deal with copyright, which I think Marvel would have given them the side eye, just like I'm sorry, what what, what did you call your dinosaur again? So I, I I believe it was two fronts that they were fighting on that one until they finally decided, oh, the Indominus Rex, perfect. And what this creature is made of, it's made out of Carnotaurus, Giganotosaurus, Majungasaurus. Rugops, Therizinosaurus, uh, Tri- uh, Velociraptor, Tyrannosaurus Rex, with a couple uh, modern-day uh, animals such as cuttlefish, tree dart, frog, and pit vipers. And the way that we're indu- introduced to the Indominus is actually kind of chilling, because first we s- really see of it is the beginning uh, sequence of Jurassic World, where we see it being born. And the first thing that we see is just her eye looking at the camera. Then it cuts away and we get a bunch of shots at the park and yada yada yada. You know, set set up the majestic look before we get into the terrifying shit. And so we meet up with the Indominus when she's almost full grown. Note, she's also got some crocodilian in her DNA to help her grow bigger. So at this point she's as big as the T-Rex, but she was designed to get bigger, which unfortunately she never got there. What a good idea! <laughs> Such a good idea. <laughs> so that that that's that's essentially uh, let's make something more dangerous and bigger. <laughs> well, it's just the the ego of man. We think we know everything, but no, we don't. No, we don't. <clears throat> but anyway, the sec the second time we meet up with the Indominus, she's almost full grown. She's big, bad. She's menacing. She's learning as she's existing and at first she just acts like a dumb animal to kind of look for an opportunity to get out and what's worse is that the third time we see her we're led to believe that she escaped because she got I I think what happened is she got a look inside of the observation uh, post that's supposed to be monitoring her and she noticed on the screen that she could see herself just as this big old red thing and she thought wait can i turn that off which she does she turn she turns off her body heat and becomes completely invisible just one of her cloaking abilities mind you so when they go in to investigate after she claws up the wall first things first she snatches one of the humans and basically bites him in half like a burrito then afterwards she chases after yeah, she burrito <laughs> yeah pretty much she chases after the other two right out the door, and essentially she is loose. And the only way that James, please. And sorry. And afterwards, she's basically out loose in the park. She's now become a whole new force of nature. And the first, the first thing that we see is that you know. The humans kind of have the upper hand. They know where she is. They they can track her. They send out a team to go and catch her. But the methods just don't do it to, to stop her. First, they discover that she clawed out her tracking beacon that also serves as a uh, 
a shocker to keep her away from the fences. And then she reveals, oh, did I mention that I could blend in with the environment? Mm-hmm. And she just slowly comes out of the trees and just pick, starts picking off all the soldiers one by one. And it's just, it was horrific to watch. But then afterwards, you see how she interacts with the dinosaurs. And she doesn't respond like a predator. She responds more like another sentient being that has just discovered what existence is. And her first response is to basically kill everything. She doesn't she doesn't eat everything, as we're led to believe. She she just goes around and just kills things. We see more of it when she slaughters an entire pod of sauropods. And then later, when they try to shoot her, she lets out a whole bunch of pterosaurs to essentially cause more havoc on the park. So it's it, it just becomes pandemonium at that point. The only thing that was able to really stop her was something bigger than her. Because even though they threw raptors, they threw a rocket launcher at this thing, they even threw the T-Rex at it. Nope. <laughs> just none of it did the trick. And essentially it took the Mosasaurus to, to take her down. Just, you know, the, the whole Star Wars line, there's always a bigger fish. And in this case, uh, just something that could clamp down on the Indominus and drown her. But had that not happened, she probably would have been the dominating force on the island, if not the extinction event. Because she went after everything. She didn't give a fuck. Mm -hmm. And what's worse is that the Indominus' legacy uh, lasted much longer after her death. We learned that there was another iteration called the Scorpius, uh, which was basically the original blueprint for the Indominus it was a lot uglier unfortunately which is why it was never released out into the park it was essentially put on ice which if you watch Camp Cretaceous she was also thought out she Vesper nodding her dress a little bit. <laughs> Vesper is just like yeah <laughs> talk about an animated <laughs> show this one. I know how this one is. <laughs> and essentially <laughs> the Scorpius meets almost a similar fate but it's crushed it, it doesn't meet a bigger predator it meets itself because it, it literally gave birth to an exact repli- uh, repli- replication of itself which is a mis- which was a mistake that I think they caught with the Indominus beforehand but mm-hmm. then again uh, I feel like the same thing could have happened it's just that they made two Indominus Rexes and the one that ends up destroying the park had ate, had eaten its sibling uh, before it even had a chance to really do anything. And of course, that leads us to the Indoraptor, which was basically born from modified genomes from the Indominus and was essentially made to be the Indominus' successor to be shipped off into the military as a uh, as a weapon. And yeah, no. What a good idea. <laughs> I mean, if you want to impress the biggest buyer, I, th- I think you might want to market that it's you know, something that could be effective in combat, which, I mean, if you look look at a bunch of animals that we've used for warfare, the most effective probably being dogs. Uh, I think an Indoraptor would probably put the dogs to shame because not only does it have keen senses of smell, it's also big, it has echolocation, and it's essentially built to tear humans apart. As good as, do- as a dog can be, an Indoraptor would be an improvement had they made it more loyal, which is basically what the Raptor training program was for. They were trying to determine would the Raptor be a more submissive uh, animal to be the be be the base genome for, which the answer was kind of yes, but at the same time it was shaky. The research wasn't complete, so that never really got to happen. So at the end of the day, I feel like the Indominus Rex has probably one of the biggest impacts in Jurassic uh, as a whole because of all the events that it sets in motion. Uh, as an antagonist yeah. itself, it's this thing is basically a supervillain in the making because it was also able to communicate with the very raptors they were trying to train and essentially turn them into henchmen. So that's what made it even more dangerous as it was able to have interactions with a lot of animals uh something we didn't get to see in the movie but we did get to see in camp cretaceous is also how it manipulated uh toro the carnotaurus into essentially being another agent of chaos so it could have easily killed toro but it chose not to it just chose to let her out and essentially it it, 
it just reached supervillain status at that point. <laughs> <laughs> just help help me destroy this park. I let you out. Do what you want. But we're gonna wreck shit. Destroy <laughs> everything. Thanks, bye. <laughs> uh, yeah. Ba we will rule the world. <laughs> Not even that. More like <laughs> we're gonna destroy the world. That's that's basically what the Indominus is. It's it's just the supervillain that's out to break we, shit. We we will rule the world from a top of pile of rubble. <laughs> Mm. Honestly, I, I feel like the Indominus is probably one of my favorite uh, movie monsters that's come out in recent years. Uh, there, right, there boy. have been there have been a lot of cool movie monsters that have come a, come and gone, but the Indominus is just one of those ones where it's like they designed this thing really, really well. It can counter almost anything like, that you throw at it. I like the the implication that they're you know very intelligent that that it's 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 smarter than your average dinosaur like a sentient being. Mm -hmm. i mean theoretically uh d dinosaurs were really smart in general like there's been like little tidbits here and there throughout uh, our discoveries that they were pretty smart in ways of like hunting and like group formations and survival so pretty logical to create a smart dinosaur just to, they just yeah. didn't realize how smart they just didn't realize the intelligent levels uh that this thing had <laughs> and it's made of some pretty intelligent uh creatures before you even add the cuttlefish the the dart frog or the pit viper the <coughs> the giganotosaurus the t-rex and the velociraptor were actually really intelligent animals uh in their times oh i believe it here's one thing i hope I hope humanity takes these movies as the warning that they are. <laughs> because when the day comes, we have the technology. Please don't make dinosaurs. <laughs> That's a terrible idea. I, 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 I would like to add something, even though it's technically not the... Not, it's, it's the Scorpius Rex. And that, that motherfucker could climb trees. The Scorpius yeah. Rex could oh, climb hell trees. Nah. Hell nah. <laughs> and he Fear. and the Scorpius Rex isn't just like it's not like a big dinosaur, but it's also not a small dinosaur. So that It's like a medium sized it, carnivore. Yeah. That motherfucker could climb trees. Yeah, that honestly, all that thing. I'm honestly inclined to believe that the Indoraptor could probably do the same thing. We just never got to see it in a natural environment. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. It was stuck in the mansion the entire time. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, I, I feel like the, the Scorpius was... It was terrifying in the sense that not only does it have an ugly design, but it had powerful legs that essentially worked the same way as a kangaroo in a few regards. Mm -hmm. the, the pouncing power that it had. It, it's both back legs and front legs were... Like... It, it was designed to just be creepy. <laughs> hell no. <laughs> just hell no. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. Like, Hi, mm -hmm. I'm here. Yeah, what makes the Indoraptor the superior out of uh, all three is that it was essentially a more uh, refined element. Uh, they again in Goji Center they actually pit the uh, the Scorpius versus the Indoraptor and the Indoraptor won because of its uh, more refined design. Uh, one of the issues that the Scorpius had was that it has brachycephaly, which is basically a squished muzzle, kind of like a Carnotaurus, uh, or for my modern day audiences that have no idea what any of these dinosaurs are, a pug. If you see a pug that oh, it, it no. has a it has a it has a smushed face, and because of that, it can't intake oxygen as well as say like a German Shepherd or heck, sometimes even a Chihuahua. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it can't right. it can't take as much oxygen in, so mm -hmm. the stamina just becomes a, a factor in uh, why the Scorpius lost to the Indoraptor. Mm-hmm. Interesting, interesting. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Well. 
That's that's my little uh, that's my little Is tidbit any? for the Indo uh, the Indo series, uh, starting with the Indominus. If there's any <laughs> if there's any warning to heed, it's if you do decide to make freaking dinosaurs for some stupid reason, at least first put research into making some like serum or something you can shoot from a helicopter that'll just stop it. <laughs> I mean, there are tranquilizers. Tranquilizers do work. It's just that the only the only animal that I mentioned that it wouldn't work on was the Indoraptor. You could shoot that thing with as many trank darts as you want. It needs special darts in order to a pierce the hide, but also fight its advanced immune system. So, because that's another thing you have to think about in warfare is that when you're when your opposing side has an animal that you don't have. You want to trank it and keep it, so that way you can turn it against them. And so that's that's what they they designed the Indoraptor to have an advanced immune system, to where if they tried to trank it, it wouldn't work. That's a terrible Damn. idea because then if it turns on you, you can't trank. Yeah, it's a it's kind of it's a cycle it's almost like it's a metaphor <laughs> it's almost like it's a metaphor it's almost like it should be done in the first place <laughs> exactly. Are exactly my point but people are dumb <laughs> so i'm trying to give them more warnings uh, yeah. all right one of the mistakes right. anyway let's uh let's wrap this up because we yeah, were about uh not only that right, but we're at right. two hours and 44 minutes all right rachel I Who don't. is the winner? I'm. You're in an unenviable position right now. <laughs> this is hard. Just go but through it. My gut. My gut is. Oh, get ready for this. I think I've come to my conclusion. <laughs> my gut. My gut is telling me that the winner today, despite all of your very hard efforts, you all did very good and very convincing, all mm. of you. But there can only be one. There can be only <laughs> one! And I think this evening, our winner is Vesper. Oh! Yeah. Let's go, Brackwoods! <laughs> Good job, Vesper. Vesper and Dahlia have taken the cake today. Very good, very good. Very well. I loved it. Oh. I loved it. <laughs> so, so, uh, my topic is monsters, which I know that we kind of, you know, that monsters aren't the same thing as villains. I'm talking... Different. I'm talking about your your demons or um, you know your ghosts, your goblins, your ghouls, your zombies. What bring me your favorite monster? Okay, uh, all right. Uh, <laughs> this is gonna be fun. I have to ask favorite you monster since, since it's spooky season. Since we're getting a little closer to spooky season, bring me your monsters. <laughs> Bring me your monsters. That way, we, before we do it, it can be any kind of monster, right? Regardless whether they're good or evil. Yes, any kind of monster. I don't care. Okay. <laughs> I don't care. Okay. Oh. This will be interesting. Very interesting. All righty. <laughs> With that being said, take us out, Rachel. I can do. Well, thank you everybody for listening. We hope you had fun exploring what's been keeping us up tonight. Make sure to describe. So, <laughs> <laughs> you want to, you want, would you like a retake? One is hitting me. Would you, would you like to retake? Uh, sure. Okay. <laughs> Go. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We hope you had fun exploring what's been keeping us all up tonight. Make sure to subscribe and see you next time to catch another sleepless night of thought-provoking conversation. Until then, go get some sleep.